Liverpool, with its miles of docks along the River Mersey. In this great centre of commerce and trade, two new cathedrals are rising above the city's skyline. The Anglican Cathedral is traditional in form and style and is being built of stone. Three quarters of a mile away, the Catholic Cathedral of Christ the King is climbing out of the ground in reinforced concrete. The architect is Frederick Gibbard, expert on town planning and the designer of London Airport. With the agreement of Cardinal Heenan, he decided to apply techniques of industrial construction using methods and materials unknown to the cathedral builders of the Middle Ages. He planned his cathedral as a great circular building, a huge volume of space to enshrine the altar at its centre. Concrete ribs rise in a cone over the sanctuary and then sweep upwards to form a great tower, high over the altar. It is to be made of concrete and coloured glass its 16 sides becoming windows to light the sanctuary below. Two artists, John Piper and Patrick Rentians, were commissioned to design and make them. John Piper was born in 1903. At the age of 12, he was sketching stained glass windows in the churches round his home. Trained for the law, he gave it up to become an art student when he was 25. His work ranges widely, from paintings in oils and watercolour to making lithographs and collage and designing sets and costumes for opera and the ballet. His enduring interest in church art and architecture has led him naturally to the design of stained glass. His most important work so far is the baptistry window of Coventry Cathedral. The window was made by Patrick Rentians. Of Russian and Flemish descent, Patrick Rentians was born in England in 1925. Trained as a painter, he has made his career the design and construction of stained glass windows using traditional methods in which thin glass is cut to shape and supported in strips of lead. But the Liverpool windows were not to be made in this way. Gibbard had designed the tower as a solid and unified structure which called for thick glass and reinforced concrete. He had originally supposed that there would be some repetition of pattern in the 16 sides of the tower. But in their search for the simplicity essential for work on such a scale, Piper and Rentians evolved a different idea. Three great areas of coloured light. A trinity of blue, yellow and red. The concrete ribs of the tower would be reduced to reference lines, 
in a continuous but varying flow of color. Gibbard and James Lowe, his consultant engineer, considered the implications. They had expected the sides of the tower to be made of reinforced concrete, inlaid with thick glass. But to achieve their design, Piper and Rentians needed to reduce the amount of concrete and use more glass in its place. There were all sorts of engineering complications, not least the selection of a material to bond glass to glass and make a strong enough joint. The material finally chosen was an industrial epoxy resin. Engineers and chemists collaborated in developing it. How would the bond weather? Would it resist fatigue? Would it last as long as the cathedral itself? In the end, an epoxy resin mix was evolved, which had all the necessary qualities. Strands of fiberglass, coated in epoxy, would be embedded in the bond at intervals to reinforce it, just as steel reinforces concrete. The mix, epicote resin, hardener, sand and carbon black, would be applied from a polythene bag, like icing a cake. At last, everyone was satisfied. Engineers and technicians, artists and craftsmen had been in touch with each other for many months. Now the work could begin of selecting the colors. From the original sketches, a full-scale cartoon for each window was worked up on the floor of Piper's studio. Paint on paper can never produce the effect of light coming through colored glass. So the cartoons stood for something that could only be demonstrated when the windows were finished, when it would be too late to make changes. The final relation between the blue, the yellow and the red was a matter for the intuitive imagination of the artists alone. The ribs within each panel were marked out in black. The lines appear random, in order to integrate the separate panels into the overall design. But the ribs must also form a framework to support the glass and enable it to resist a hurricane. So they have to meet the requirements, not only of the artists, but also of the engineers. The understanding between artists and engineers was so good that the occasions were few when a line had to be moved or added.
The panels were made in a small studio at Loudwater, outside London, specially designed for the job. It was equipped with tables on which the panels could be cast and glazed. All the panels were 12 feet wide, but they varied in height from 6 to 10 feet. The glass itself was one inch thick. Paper templates, glued to polythene, were used to position the glass. When all the pieces were in place, the first layer of epoxy resin mix was squeezed out between them. In a few hours, the separate pieces of glass become a solid slab, bonded to the panel. As each panel was cleaned and lifted, the polystyrene blocks used to support the glass while it set were pulled away. Once approved by Rentians, the panels were put into store till the time came for them to be hoisted into place on the tower. This is the largest commission for stained glass in the history of the church, accomplished by the coming together of architect and artists, engineers, technologists and craftsmen. Together they have produced a crown of glass for the Cathedral of Christ the King. Yeah.